Hello, and welcome to our City Center Church YouTube page. Here you will find our latest content and our live streaming. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, hit the like button, and hit the bell icon so you'll be notified the next time we go live. Why don't you look at the end of John 21? I want to look at something quick and then. When Pastor Matt said, nobody owes you a thing, that was something Holy Spirit taught me a long time ago, and I, I can promise you it transformed my life. I realized that my whole life I let what was going on, who was saying what, wasn't saying what, doing what, wasn't doing what. I was letting my whole life be decided and dictated by how it unfolded and how people lived towards me. And, and all of a sudden I realized my whole life was so bound and limited to and ruled by just the way it happened instead of who was in me. Like who was in me was, was never dominant until I realized it. Until I realized nobody owes me a thing. And all of a sudden, well, he said, well, they should have never. Well, how come they? Well, I don't know what, but that hurt. Well, that made me feel. If you think about all the stuff we grew up with saying and thinking is right and that it's never produced life. It's just made people right and people wrong. But it's never produced life. I've never seen the mentality produce Christ. Anybody counsel people in here? Who, who's in leadership, counsels, does counseling, sits with folks? Yeah, that's a handful. Good. Tell me if I'm telling the truth. 90% of your counseling is people struggling with people. Amen. Yeah, strong amen from the counselor, see? <laughs> it's people struggling with people. And it reveals that we don't understand some things about the cross, about who we are now in Christ. And, and it's not that you're just passive. It's not that you're a doormat. It's not that you just turn a blind eye or, or wink at things. It's you don't let it affect you because when people are doing things outside of truth, outside of love, you can't let that affect you. You can't let where they're not decide where you are. Why do you let where people aren't dominate where you are and then we sing he's Lord? See, who he is has to dominate where I am. Who he is, who he created me to be, who he called me to be. I want to, I want to read this. This, this. this is just stirring in me this morning. There's, who knows that, that James, the book of James says, be slow to speak, be slow to anger, be slow to anger, be slow to speak, and be quick to listen. Who knows that we almost all of us grew up ticked off, don't want to hear it, and a whole lot to say. <laughs> Who would agree that's true? Isn't it amazing that Scripture says what we're to be, and we grew up the total opposite? It's not an accident. What's love do? Love lays down its life for another. Doesn't love lay down its life for another? What have we done most of our life without even thinking about it, lived at the expense of others? You can be in a family that's actually very loving and you can still live at the expense of your family. You can just cop an attitude that puts pressure on your household. All of a sudden, you're not even adding to the life. You're making a draw on the life. You're actually making a draw withdrawal on the life. You're, you're making a demand on love. Instead of you being love, you're making a demand on love. You just keep a bad attitude in a marriage. You just give a silent treatment for your spouse for half a day. What are we doing? Living at the expense of love. Living at the expense of others. And we don't have a conviction of that because we think that's normal because we all grew up self-centered and self-focused. But Jesus isn't like that at all. I've looked, man. I can't find him like that at all. He's amazing. So I don't want to call normal what's not what I was created to be. I don't want to call it normal if it wasn't what I was intended to be, if it's not love. So when he says nobody owes you a thing, that sounds like a radical thought in the world I grew up in, the mentality I grew up with, in a thing ruled by rightness, and he said, she said, and tit for tat, and victim villain, and well, they shouldn't have, well, how come they, well, I wouldn't be if they didn't. Come on, that's all we've known. And then Holy Spirit says, Psst, hey, nobody owes you a thing. Why? Because love, love owes no man anything but to love. It doesn't seek its own. So if you take that component out, seeking your own, and you start understanding, watch this, if every Christian would start just considering this and dwelling on this and meditate on this, watch. Wow, he really called me out of darkness. 
He really took me out of the world and translated me into the kingdom of the son of his love. He's not just here to bless me, protect me, keep me, and make sure things go good for me. He separated me, he sanctified me into a new way of thinking, into a new life. He brought me out of darkness into the light. Come on, this is Christianity. We, we, unfortunately, all we preach is a beneficial message that takes me to heaven when I die. I'm not against heaven. I'm not mad about heaven. I think it's amazing we're going to live forever. And I think it's amazing we're going to be in his presence forever. It says to be with him is far better. Who knows that's true? So we're not coming against eternal life. Eternal life was just always in the plan. God never made man to die. He said the day you eat the tree is the day you surely die, meaning death was never in the plan. So what did he do? He redeemed the plan. Are you with me? So he redeemed the plan, so we're never going to die. What did he do? He brought us back and made us one with the eternal one. So now we're back to the Father. We're one with the one that's eternal. No one's going to snatch us out of the palm of his hand. So he made man to live forever with him, in him, and by him. Yeah? And when that was lost through sin, it wasn't lost in God. So he just paid the price to redeem it because he had a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But see, I didn't grow up hearing this. I just grew up hearing I was a miserable sinner. I had wicked in my heart, and, and, and I needed forgiven. Who knows I was a sinner? Who knows I had wicked in my heart? I'm not downcasting that, but there's more to the message. Come on. There has to be this side of the cross. Okay, so my sin, I'm aware of it. It brings me to the cross. I got the blood of Jesus speaking better things. I got the mercy of God and the love of God saying, or Jesus saying, Father, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. This boy is blind. He has no idea idea who he is that's really what Jesus is saying this guy doesn't even know why he's on the earth he thinks he's on the earth to survive he's on the earth to shine to live by my spirit to walk in love and to manifest my great name forgive him father he doesn't know what he's doing my goodness he thinks he's on the earth to survive he thinks somebody owes him something he's living to get a fair shake He's lost in a lonely, self-centered world. Forgive him, Father. Come on. <laughs> Come on, we've all lived that way. We've all felt sorry for ourselves. We all tried to gain friends that, that agreed with our pain and suffering that gave us sympathy instead of answers. Be real with me. Is, am I too intense for a Saturday morning? Are you okay or are you just like this? Okay, because you are extremely sitting there quiet. I'm like... But that's okay, you're probably just thinking. It's convicting. It's convicting. The gospel's to transform your life. The way I was living has nothing to do with what he created me to be. And then the twists and the, and the stuff, like the, the slow to speak, the slow to anger, the quick to listen, it's, it's not. And now I get why we're ticked off, don't want to hear it, and got a whole lot to say. Because everything, the coin flipped. Everything 180 through sin. I want, I want you to see this. This is amazing what we tend to do. I have a friend, a pastor. He preaches all the time, and he's really good. He's clear. He, I love him. He lives Jesus. He walked through some stuff that people don't even make it through. I mean, he, he, he watched his little girl should have been dead in a wreck. He just sat by her ICU bed while she had a crushed skull. If you'd see the, if you'd see the x-rays, it's mind-boggling. A shattered skull with a bone shard in her brain. Doctors expecting to lose another child to a car wreck in their city. And God brought her the whole way through. He ministered to families and saw a couple surgeries canceled. He's just full of peace and full of God. And the whole time the reality is this little girl's laying there and you can't even recognize her because her head is bigger than a basketball. That's amazing. See, you can't tell me you can't live this way. I watched some people do it. <laughs> Doesn't mean he doesn't love her. Doesn't mean he doesn't care. He just trusts Jesus more than the situation. And he's already settled in his heart a long time ago. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, he's called to something and he's going to live it. And he's not going to let anything be greater than what he's here for. Come on, be real with me. I'm getting nitty gritty on a Saturday morning. You're here for a reason. You have life for a purpose. And you have to lay a hold of that and not let anything get into the way of the why behind your life. That's why people float and skate and up and down and highs and lows and in and out. Because they're not living established in the truth of why they're really here. Come on, I'm talking plain to you this morning. You, you all right with this? 
See, because if you don't have that locked in, then you're just a distraught father and your fingers are crossed and you're crying out scripture as principles hoping they work. Instead of already knowing in your heart that no matter what happens in the situation, even though I'm believing for the restoration, deep down in your heart, you're already settled that nothing can change why I'm here. That's true faith. That's true surrender. That's selflessness. Rather than lose your daughter in that situation and then you change, you back off on God, you have more questions than you have revelation. Why? How? Why us? How come? God, we're only laying down our life trying to do. And all of a sudden we, we pray as if we were in some kind of bargain. Look, I've been doing nothing good. I've been this, I've been that. Why did you let this? And it's almost as if God failed and I'm doing my part and where were you? See, when you have that mentality, which is a worldly mentality, it's a self-centered mentality, you'll never have faith and trust in God. You'll have love and honor for God. He's actually always on trial through the way life unfolds. And your view of him can change in one circumstance. And you reveal that you never actually understood covenant and you never actually had a true relationship. Come on, I'm just talking plain. This stuff, listen, we got to run well. We got to run to the end. How are we going to run a race worthy of a prize if we trip and stumble all along the way? Man, let's run this race. Let's break a record time. Let's just get to the finish line, man. Let's not stop at every refreshment table and let's not bow out and just sit on the bleachers. Let's run this race. You got it. You're in a race. Let's run it, man. But he says something. My pastor friend says something all the time. I told you that story because I wanted to say what he says. He always says, he says, he says, uh, hear what I'm saying. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. And I've learned that most people that criticize the gospel and watch preachers and have this critical thing on them, they're, they're always saying what you're not saying. They're saying you meant this. They're saying you said this. They're saying you said that. And then they write a two-page rebuttal on what you didn't even say. I've heard it about me a lot. Well, I don't like him because he says he doesn't sin. I've never said in my life I don't sin. I don't think about sin. I don't think about sin. I'm not expecting to sin. I didn't wake up to sin. I woke up to be a son. I woke up to walk in the light. I woke up to walk in love. And that just bothers people and boggles their mind. Why? Because most people have a different identity of themselves. And when they look in the mirror, they don't even like what they see. I look in the mirror, I love what I see. I see a man being redeemed and built up in Christ. I see a man loved and sanctified and bought with the blood. I see a man that has purpose and destiny. People haven't always treated me right. I haven't always done the right thing. But I've been washed, I've been forgiven, and my heart has integrity. And I want to do the right thing. And I ain't thinking about sin. I ain't looking for sin. I ain't waiting to fail. But if I would bump into it, and see that just drives people crazy because I'm not coming right out and saying I've sinned yet this morning because to my conscience, I don't believe I have. Yeah. See, that just blows people out of the water because they think we're sinning while we're breathing. <laughs> get born again. Amen. And get sin consciousness out of your life. If I reckon myself dead indeed to sin, how can I boast in my ability to commit it continually and call that humility? I call it deception. But people, people continue to say, well, he says he doesn't sin. He says he's perfect. I'm complete in Christ. You better believe the blood has made me complete. It's not a high-minded thing. It's called faith. Do you understand that pride resists, humility receives? The people that are resisting the gospel are actually in a false humility, which is equal to pride. If God says you're accepted and you're coming up with some reason why you might not be able to, you're fighting against truth, so truth can't make you free. And then when somebody's proclaiming truth, you think they're a heretic because you don't relate and understand because it ain't your life. Well, just because it ain't your life doesn't mean it ain't somebody's life. <laughs> Well, I ain't never seen that. Doesn't mean somebody didn't. See how we're always tricked into making us the standard. Self-centeredness is a wretch, man. I'm telling you, it's a wicked, demonic wretch. Self-centeredness is a wicked, demonic wretch. Well, that ain't never happened to me. Don't mean it didn't happen to somebody. You see what we do? Come on, you know I'm telling you the truth. Watch this. I want you to see this. This is in the end of John 21 where Jesus is loving on Peter and he's asking if he loves him. And he's like, yeah, I love you. He's telling him to feed his sheep, tend his sheep. 
He says, most assuredly, I say in verse 8 to you, Peter, when you were younger, you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke signifying the death in which he would glorify God. And when he spoke in this, he said to him, follow me. So he gave him a heads up and then he said, hey, follow me. Now watch what Peter does. This is fascinating. We're not busting on Peter. We're learning from Peter. This is human nature. This is tendency. Watch what Peter did. I'm telling you, a whole lot of folks have done this. We ought to read our Bibles and learn this stuff. Watch. Peter turning around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Don't you like that John's writing about himself and he calls himself the disciple Jesus loved? <laughs> what a heretic. What a blasphemer. Who does he think he is? I think he knows who he is. And just because you don't relate to that revelation, don't call him something else. This is pretty amazing to me that he says the, the disciple that Jesus loved. You ought to say that about yourself every morning because it's true because the cross says yay. Yeah? Now, you don't do that to buy time. You don't do that to hide behind words. You believe that and it changes your heart. See, do you understand that I'm not living my life out of discipline? There's discipline in my life. Discipline's a good thing and it's important in things. I live my life out of the revelation of God's love for me. Like I belong. We... We sing this stuff, guys. Like I'm in, I'm not out. I'm accepted, I'm not rejected. I'm forgiven, I'm not unforgiven. You get it? It motivates me, it stirs me towards him. His goodness has led me to change. It empowers me to, to live what's possible and receive the grace of God to become what I could never be in my own strength. And all of a sudden, I'm actually living a supernatural life. Jesus calls you to Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, the attitudes of being. He calls, it, he calls us to it. If you, if you hear him, he's saying this is what our lives should be, could be, or called to be, doesn't he? But it's impossible to live that. To live the Sermon on the Mount is impossible. That's why he gave us the Holy Spirit. That's why he gives us faith. That's why I ask us to repent, because grace can empower you to live what you could never live on your own. If he can get in and change your perspective, turn your heart and align you with truth, truth make you free, who the sun sets free is free indeed, all of a sudden you won't buy into the same lies, you won't make the same mistakes, you'll produce something totally different than before you see what you see. Are you with me? Oh, it's just good news. Watch this. Peter turning around after Jesus said, listen, man, when you were young, you went where you wanted. When you grow old, you're going to go where you don't want to go. Signifying the death he's going to die. What's he talking about? Arms stretched out. Yeah? So if Jesus tells Peter you're going to die on the cross, do you think Peter's going to die on the cross? Or do you think he's not and Jesus is going to say, oh, I thought you would. <laughs> And then he turns around and says what? Follow me. I'm just giving you a heads up. Follow me. This is what's going to happen. You follow me. Don't get in fear. Don't get discouraged. Don't get angry. Don't Come on, follow me. I'm being honest. Your, your commitment, your life, what they did to me, you're going to see them do it to you. Follow me. He's inviting him in to his life. Now watch this. Peter turning around, he saw the disciple who Jesus loved following who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is it who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? <laughs> Ain't that something? Human nature? You just get told what Peter gets told. He looks at John and says, well, what about him? Are they going to stretch him out? Is he going to die? What, like, what about John? Do you see how distractive that is? Do you see how that can actually rule your heart, manipulate your heart? I love what Jesus said to Peter. Peter said, if I will, or Jesus said to Peter when he asked that, he said, if I will that he remain till I come. He's just challenging Peter's distraction. In other words, Peter, did I just ask you to follow me? Because if that stays your question, you're not going to follow me. Your eyes are on John. You're all worked up about John. And you're wondering, you're thinking you're getting unfair treatment. And that can lead to whoever and whatever. And next thing you know, you haven't even followed me because your eyes are on something else. If I will that he remain, what is that to you? 
Come on, that's a strong, amazing phrase coming from a God that's love. Is he being rude? Is he being biased and partial? Nope, he's saying the calling is the calling. Understand it and live it. Watch this. If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Do you get that? In other words, get your eyes off of everybody else and everything that's going on around you. You woke up in him and you woke up with him in you. Yeah? And you got a purpose in your life. Nobody owes you a thing. You have a destiny to fulfill. Get your eyes off all these other things. You don't say, well, what about so-and-so? Well, how come that never happened to him? Well, God, why don't? Well, he seems to be making more mistakes than me and he doesn't even get them. Why do I feel like I'm always getting hammered? God, what's going on? Yeah? So he's trying to turn, but this is amazing if you actually read. This disciple, this is the disciple who testifies of these things, who wrote these things. In other words, the one that's writing is the one we're talking about right now. It's me. I'm John. And we know that his testimony is true. (laughs) You go, John. (laughs) And there are also... uh, Yeah, there are also many other things that Jesus did, which they were written, and I love this. I would suppose that even the world, I don't totally get this. This just tells you it's a whole lot of stuff. Would not contain the books if they were written one by one. Thank you, Lord. So watch this. In verse 23, when he says, if I will that he remain till I come, What is that to you? You follow me. Now watch. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Do you see what people do with what Jesus says? They say what he didn't say. They do it to preachers all the time. They say what you didn't say. You ought to see some of the emails. I don't get a lot of hate mail. People don't bother hate mail me, which is fine. Save your hate mail. I don't read my emails anyway. (laughs) I just don't. I got too many. There's just emails. (laughs) I never even asked for any of this, man. Somebody put me on YouTube and (laughs) I got emails, Lord Jesus. I got emails. I'm not trying to build a ministry. I'm not trying to build a kingdom. I'm just living my life in Jesus. And people ask me, come to their church. (laughs) And we have painted a picture of what a ministry is supposed to be, should be, and needs to be. And I don't even think ministry. I just think living my life in Christ. I'm zero administrative. I'm just not into social media. I don't get on any of it. I am zero interested. I don't read all them emails. (laughs) Every once in a while, the girl that does read them, she slides a few my way and just wants me to see them. It's amazing how every once in a while she'll slide me one and says, I was listening to you preach and you said, with quotes, bop, 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 bop. And I'm like, I don't even believe what you just wrote I said. I don't even believe that. I know I didn't say that. And then they write a whole page of rebuttal on what I didn't say. See why I shouldn't bother reading emails? It's frivolous. Sometimes people even have their heart set against you. Like, no matter what you say, it wouldn't be sufficient. That's why Jesus didn't speak in front of Pilate. Because he already knew their heart and motive. He's not going to give them the right to judge him anymore. He's just stayed silent. He said, you're not going to speak. You have nothing to say. The Pharisees and Sanhedrin were hammering him. Don't you hear what these men testify? You have nothing to say to defend yourself. As soon as you defend yourself, you give the right to people to judge you. So he already knows their hearts are twisted. They're set on this. And there's nothing he could say to change it. So just let men do what they do. What did he say in the garden? Do what you came to do. It's the hour of darkness. In other words, I'm just going to let this unfold. I'm just going to let it happen. That's why I didn't say a word. That's why I never respond to all that stuff. I never respond to any of that. And I don't try to find fault in the criticizers. Because that wouldn't be the Lord either. You just keep living your life in Jesus. You trust what God's doing through your life. And one day, you believe you'll stand before him and you'll have fruit in your account. 
Yeah. Watch. This saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him he would not die. You hear what John's doing? He said, man, there's a lot of people out there saying Jesus said something that he didn't say. He didn't say this disciple wouldn't die. He just said, if I choose, he remain till I come. What's that to you? Follow me. And people turned it into something else. Be very careful in your hearing, your discerning, and be very careful in your quoting and your preaching. That you're not saying what wasn't said. I just think it's amazing Jesus makes one statement and the word that goes out isn't even what he said. Look at what happened to Jesus. This is sobering to me. What am I doing all this for? Why am I even saying this? So you guard your heart and be careful how you hear. Jesus said, be careful how you hear. He that has ears to hear. Here's what I'm saying. Was Jesus just preaching the truth or was he the truth? He is the truth. Watch. He spoke to men for three years. Three years. He spoke. Is that fair? For about three years, he spoke to men only what God was saying. Was it truth the whole time? Did it have a twist to it? Or was it truth? They killed him for what he said. Men. Leaders. Rulers of the synagogue. The truth stands in front of them and preaches for three years and they kill him for his words. That's sobering and frightening. That men could be so wrong and believe they're so right that they could kill a man because they're sure he's wrong. Ain't that something? That's why Jesus said, even if you don't believe me for my words, believe me for the work's sake. For it's the Father working in me. And even if you have trouble with what I'm saying, why don't you take a good look at my life and how can you deny that the Father's working through me? <laughs> See how you know them by their fruits? See how it's your life lived? It's going to stand for all time before God is a testimony. You know them by their Man, store up your treasures in heaven. That's why you don't find your identity through ministry, through your preaching, through your title, through your service in the church. You find your identity through relationship with Christ and how he sees you through the blood. And that way, no matter what anybody says, nothing's going to move you. Does that make sense? Okay. Just trying to encourage you in some things. So guard your heart in that stuff. Because Jesus never said that about John and word went out that that's what he said. And it's crazy how people make jokes and say, yeah, like everything on the internet's true, and they'll make a joke like it's not, but then they believe everything they read. Yeah. People go on social media and, and believe what's going around. And it taints their soul, and they hear it, and it might not be that true at all, but because they read it, they have it in their soul. And then when they hear that situation, they go, oh, yeah, that's that situation. And the first thing that comes to mind is the derogatory thing they read. You better guard and protect your soul in this hour. There's a lot of things floating around. There's a lot of chaos and confusion. Why? Because we read last night, self-centeredness. Wherever there's self-centeredness, there's confusion in every evil work existing. We Christians better live sanctified and make sure we're not self-centered, that we're not touchy, that we don't move and shake by every word and everything that we hear outside. Yeah? We better be a little more established than that. Amen? Amen. I want you to see something in Genesis. I want you to look at this. I keep talking about selfishness being a wretched thing. It's a very wretched thing. God never made man to be self-centered. God made man for his image. Genesis tells you that. Let us make man in our image. Genesis 1, 27, 26. He said, let us make man in our image. In verse 27, he made man in his image and his own likeness, both male and female. Do you hear that, ladies? Your created value and true job description, if you will. <laughs> if you look in the, the manufacturer's handbook or the ownership's manual or the manufacturer's handbook, the female has the same calling and job description as the male to walk in God's image. Amen. I just think that's amazing. 
Every woman can shine as a light. Every woman can manifest love. Every woman can follow the Spirit of God and walk in Jesus and live in Jesus just like any man can. You're not limited to walk in love. You're not limited to manifest His image. He made both male and female in His likeness and in His image. It's there on purpose. Amen? Amen. Some things happened in the relationship between man and woman after sin. After God spoke because of sin. You have to you have to separate all that. That's where loneliness entered in. That's where hurt entered in. That's where self-defense and self-justification. Adam ate the fruit of the tree. And the first evidence of sin and self-centeredness is he's blaming God and he's blaming the woman without flat out saying it. He's asked a simple question. Did you eat of the fruit of the tree? How'd you know you were naked? Did you eat the fruit that I commanded you not to eat? And he said, it was the woman you gave me for she gave me to eat. That is a very lame answer. It's not a truthful answer. It's a compromised answer. And in his answer, there's a suggestion. Look, you gave me the woman. She gave me to eat. If you wouldn't have gave me the woman, I'd probably be standing here still clothed in innocence. Woman, what's this you've done? It was the devil. He made me do it. It's her answer. It's a serpent. He gave me to eat. I was deceived and I ate. That's actually a better answer than Adam's. Adam's answer was pitiful. <laughs> it's a yes and no question. Did we do it our whole lives? Hey, which one of you broke that? He broke it. No, -uh, he broke it. No, he broke it. Did you break it? Well, yeah, but I didn't try it. I mean, he pushed me. And if he didn't push me, and I mean, he pushed me. I you couldn't just say, yeah, I broke it. You had to come up with a justifiable reason and blame shift in the process. Take the pressure off. Come out clean. I remember getting my brother spanked over something I broke, man. I was such a good liar. It was terrible. Oh, it was terrible. It was terrible. I remember him going up the stairs with my dad, and I was like, whoo, glad it ain't my butt. I mean, my dad was drinking all the time, and he'd give some whoopings. He'd strip down your pants. He'd take, he'd, he'd just, oh, it was so humiliating. He'd sit on the bed. He'd say, pull down your pants. Put that, get them down right now. <laughs> Turn around. Wah, wah, wah. I remember one day I couldn't get my pants open. I was so nervous. I, said, I can't get them in here. I ripped them off. <laughs> I must have really earned that one. But I'll never forget it. My brother's going up the steps and he's screaming, I can't believe you're doing this. He did it. He did it. I can't believe you're doing this. And I stayed so calm. I was like, man, I can't believe. He's going to stand there and blame it on me. <laughs> and it was me the whole time. And then my mom looks at me and she's crying. And she said, you better not be lying. Said, mom, I'm not lying. I wouldn't have him up there getting spanked for me. He just doesn't want to get spanked. He's the one rather get me spanked than him. See, it's all anti-Christ. What did Jesus do? He took the spanking. Jesus got spanked for every one of us. He didn't say, well, Father, they're the one that did it. Why should I do it? I've been a good son. I've been always a good son. No, nope. love said, you know what? I'll take their spanking. I'll take the wrath. I'll take everything that they deserve and put it on me. And get them scot-free so we can start this thing over and afresh. We can put our life back in them. We can sanctify them from the world. We clothe them in righteousness, and they can walk in love. Guys, we've turned that into getting by in life, using God to get through instead of using God to shine. But my brother went up there and got whooped. Oh, and I can remember being so self-centered that I was rejoicing it was his button, not mine. Total opposite of Jesus. <laughs> I think we were like, I don't know, probably in my 20s when I knew nobody was going to spank me when we one day were all over at Christmas or something. I said, remember I lied and got you spanked? Yeah, remember? You need to tell them the truth. And they're like, you broke that lamp? And I said, you ain't spanking me. <laughs> See, I was so wretched though. Like, think how terrible that is. Look what happened here in this. In this. this is amazing. This is amazing. So, so, so we know that God told, told Adam, 
Let's just go to Genesis 3. Okay, we can jump in there. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat every tree of the garden? So God already gave them that commandment. And, uh, okay, good. Let me see this here. At the end of Genesis 2, Lord, just help me here. Would you just be clear? At the end of, 20, of 2, 24, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And look what it throws in here. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife were not ashamed. So I've heard a lot of preachers say they were so covered with God's glory, so clothed that it had all their vital parts shielded. And No, they were totally innocent. They had no knowledge of evil. Watch. They didn't even see themselves because all they saw was him. It's phenomenal. It makes it a point to let us know they were naked and not ashamed. I was in a Methodist church. They asked me to come to a Methodist church. I was by far the youngest person there. (laughs) Everybody could have been my parents or grandparents. And I had so much fun with this. I said, right now, I said, all your clothes would just disappear. We'd find out how lost our innocence was. You'd be grabbing hymnals. You'd be grabbing Bibles. (laughs) And they were all like, what's he talking about? (laughs) Is he allowed to talk like this in church? (laughs) It was hilarious. (laughs) We made out good. It worked out well. But I did shock them a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> I was teaching on how innocence got lost through sin and the knowledge of evil came into the souls of men. There was no knowledge of evil. It was just a knowledge of God and God's good. They were naked and not ashamed. Why? Because they didn't see themselves apart from him. They didn't see themselves at all. They were innocent and pure. And holy in God. It's an amazing picture. So that tells you there's no lust. There's no need. Total fulfillment. And total beauty in the Lord. Whew. Ain't that something? So the devil pops in there. Now you have to understand. The serpent's more cunning of the field. And he said to the woman. Now watch this. This is our first evidence. It's already in Genesis 3. But it's our first evidence that this is the only time Eve has heard another voice outside of God. He's only heard God's voice. She's only heard God's voice. Is that true? According to Scripture? And now the serpent spoke, and now she has to deal with another voice. Do you see where analytical reasoning comes from? You see where just human rationale just comes from? You see how people that get tricked into overthinking, and they almost pridefully say, well, I'm a thinker. Or I'm analytical. I'm a very analytical. I just have to process. You might be doing yourself great damage. You might be listening to another voice. You have the voice of the Lord. Why do you need to analyze the voice of the Lord? If God says, I love you, why do you have to think hard enough to come up with a reason why he might not? See, it's not a gift. God never gave you the gift of talking yourself out of him. It came from the serpent. Even saying what God said and putting a little slant on it. I mean, Satan quotes scripture all the time. about He quoted scripture to Jesus in the wilderness. In fact, he probably knows scripture better than most Christians. And then he has a PowerPoint and a play on that. So he uses scripture and twists it. He was cunning. And he said, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? A woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree in which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it. You shall not touch it, lest you die. Now, I know he said you don't don't eat it. I don't remember him saying you don't touch it, but obviously she had a revelation, just stay away from the tree. Then the serpent said to the woman, this is another voice. 
Oh, you're not going to die. You're surely not going to die. For God knows, imposes to know God, know his intentions, know his heart. Almost as if he has God figured out and laid out here. For God just knows that in a day, who's ever had that go on in their mind and it interprets God and how he must feel about you now and that he just knows this and that and, and because you this and then and it is usually a condemning tone or a hopeless tone. Who's ever had that happen in their soul where all of a sudden this thing starts speaking and it's not that encouraging and all of a sudden there's a concern behind it and you think it might be true and now there's less life than there was before you heard it. See, when you see what that thing's producing, it should give away where it's coming from. If Jesus came to give you life and life more abundantly, he's speaking things that promote life. So even if he brings a correction, there's always a strong answer. Even if he brings an adjustment, there's always a greater opening to travel. Do you see what I mean? So if what you're thinking and what you're believing doesn't produce life, it cannot be from the Lord. It's a good barometer, guys. If you're dwelling on something and it's mellowing you out, it's concerning you, it's making you fearful or depressed or discouraged or self-focused, cannot be the Lord, cannot be hinged on truth because you know things by their fruit. And everything's trying to reproduce itself after its own kind and everything is looking to have children. Each seed after its own kind. So the enemy is cunning. And he says, okay, I'll get him to believe this thought. That thought becomes a stronghold and a belief, and now it becomes a fruitful tree. And the whole time it was built on a lie and on false soil. It's what you see in here. For God just knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. They were already made in his image. And all they knew was him and all they knew was the good sides, right? They didn't know anything, not the good sides of God. There's no bad side of God. What I mean is they didn't know the knowledge of evil. All they knew was good. That's incredible. That's why Romans says now to the New Testament church, be excellent what is good, be innocent of evil. Yeah? Or be innocent of evil and be excellent in what is good. It's in that order. And your eyes will be opened knowing good and evil. She wasn't created to know evil. She was created to know God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise. So she listened to what he said, looked at the tree, and went, mm, and was deceived because everything she looked about the tree seemed pleasant and desirable. Now watch this. It doesn't say, it just says that Adam was there with her in the garden. It doesn't say he heard the voice of the serpent. I don't believe he did personally. I believe he heard the voice of Eve. Because God said, because you heeded the voice of your wife instead of me, this has come upon you. Are you hearing me? I don't believe Adam was listening to the serpent. I believe she had her own conversation with the serpent. Because watch this. She also gave to her husband with her, her husband with her. So everybody says, well, he was right there. No, he's in the garden. See, God said... Because you heeded the voice of your wife instead of me. What happened? This strange voice came that we're not supposed to follow. But it sounded rational and it's cunning. And it seemed to know God and understand some things. And all of a sudden she got her eyes on the thing that was forbidden and it looked permissible. She was deceived and she ate. What'd she do to her husband? Hey, look, it appears that she told him what she heard. Look, there's nothing really wrong with this tree. God just knows that the day we eat it, our eyes will be open and we'll be like him. What happened? Satan reproducing after his own kind. He took his message, put it into her. She acted on it, gave it to her husband. He acted on it, separate from God. You see what happened? It's absolutely amazing. I've told it over the years where like she became a voice for the lie. You ever see that happen with people? Yeah. yeah. So now here's the most tragic like thing except for God came and, and he's good. But when you see what sin does, when you see the effect of sin. So it grieves my heart when people 
just want to keep sin so alive. Like, yeah, but brother, we always sin. Yeah, but we're always going to sin. See, that's not the topic. The topic is righteousness, justified, vindicated, clean. You're clean because of the word I've spoken. Why are we fighting what the gospel accomplished? Put on the robe of righteousness, wear it, and look good in it. And quit fighting it. Like, what? You see? So watch this. This is, this is amazing what sin did. Then, then, then watch this. He ate. Then the eyes of both of them were what? Oh, my goodness. Opened. And they knew that they were naked. So this wasn't a good thing. Because in verse 25, they were both naked and they didn't have a clue. What happened because of sin? For the first time, they saw themselves. And they saw themselves apart from God. And it's a lack of innocence. And you're naked and you're ashamed. And it's called sin conscious. Called sin conscious. It's called carnal minded. You know what it does? It runs from its only help. The love of God. So God comes into the garden walking in the cool of the day. Must have been normal. Must have been something they were used to because they knew the sound. And they knew he was coming to fellowship. And what'd they do? For the first time they ran and hid instead of ran and greeted. And all of a sudden they were afraid of the only one that loves. You see the peril of sin and self-consciousness? They saw themselves in a different light. God asked Adam a question. Hey, have you eaten the tree that I forbid you? This is the woman you gave me for she gave me to eat. Do you see the peril of everything that just took place in a moment? He gives some words to each of them, to the devil, to the woman, and to, to Adam. In verse 20, Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of the living. And also Adam and his wife, for Adam and his wife, the Lord. Watch this. Oh, you got to love this. The Lord. Don't miss this stuff in your Bible. The Lord made. The Lord made tunics of skin and he clothed them. What happened there? They heard the sound of the Lord come, and they had made fig leaves for themselves to cover their nakedness. Who knows you can't cover your nakedness, that nakedness is even a thing of the soul. You could be wearing fig leaves, and you're still naked. Because you see yourself, you're apart from God, you're exposed. The fig leaves didn't give them confidence to stand in the sound of the Lord coming. Are you with me? You can't cover your own sin, because your soul's aware of it. There's nowhere to hide, but they're trying to. You see the blight of sin and sin consciousness and sin awareness? So what's God do? He comes and he promises that there's a seed coming through the woman that's going to crush the seed that just sprouted in the garden in man's life. That he's going to come and he's going to crush the head of the, of the serpent. And the only thing the serpent's going to do is bruise his heel, and that's actually the pummeling Jesus took on the cross. You're just going to, you're just going to, you're just going to smash his body. He's going to crush your head and take back all the authority. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what happened. And then God takes off the fig leaves that they put, their own attempt to cover their sin, their own attempt to cover their sin, he takes that off. And with his own hands, he had to make these skins. He had to do that himself. He puts animal skins on them. Why? If you wake up every day wearing the fig leaves, what are you conscious of? What's the only thing you can think of? It's the day you sinned, the day you messed up, the day everything changed. And then if we could only go back and see what it was like. I know how this happens in families. And all of a sudden, they're sitting there in the demise of the fall. They're sitting there separate from the glory they had. They can't even go back in the garden anymore. Next thing you know, you wake up and you're in a miserable place. And you look at your wife and say, why did you have to listen to that stupid snake? Well, you listened to me. You didn't have to eat. Now it's just tit for tat. Now it's just he said, she said. Well, it was your fault, your fault. It's how relationships get destroyed because the seed of self-centeredness is there. Yeah, come 
Make no mistake about it. The prerequisite for coming to Jesus isn't praying a prayer to go to heaven. It's deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow Jesus. That's born again. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Follow Jesus. Not ask him into your heart. Give him your life. And deny yourself. Jesus never preached what we preach at our articles. He didn't preach what we write on those tracks. We make it all about us getting something instead of becoming something. And we're doing a disjustice and in service to people. We're just making it about getting a benefit from the Lord instead of getting new life through Jesus Christ. So we, we highlight that our sins are forgiven, but we're still going to sin, but they're forgiven, and one day we're going to heaven. Our sins are forgiven, but make no mistake about it, you're still going to sin, and one day we're going to heaven. So you just left me a hopefully forgiven sinner, but life's the same. Same attitude, same motives, still mad at my wife, still got unresolved conflicts, still wish I could whip some sense into that boy of mine, and don't like my boss at all, and I wish I had a new job, and life is tough, but man, one day we'll get out of here. And praise the Lord, hallelujah. Come on! Such a lie. Yeah. I'm not growling at people. Just, that just bugs me. That's a lie. And we buy into that thing. Somehow preach that stuff with confidence. What's he do? Puts on animal skins. So every preacher in their right, they're right. They're not wrong. Every preacher preaches the blood covenant that them animals had to shed blood to give up their skins. It's true. And sin costs life, and life's in the blood, and it takes life to redeem life. So those little animals died for the sins of Adam and Eve. You can preach the blood covenant there. You can actually preach the shedding of blood. But it's way deeper. It's righteousness. It's God seeing them for purpose and potential and created value. It's God clothing them, not them clothing themselves. If they clothe themselves, all they're aware of is their fault. If God clothes them, all they're aware of is promise. Now every day they wake up wearing something different that he put on them. It's actually symbolic. It's pointing to today. It's pointing to the robes of righteousness we're all to be wearing that he made with his own body. His own hands, if you will. He stretched them out and made us robes. And he took off our fig leaves, our hiding, our denial, our deception, and he clothed us with what he made, righteousness. Are you hearing me? Please, you got to wear it. It's the only thing you look your best in. No, you look your best in it. Come on, you're trying to find the perfect outfit, you got it. What's it matter if you find the perfect outfit in the flesh and you look amazing, but you don't live amazing? And your heart's not content in God. And you're not at peace with God. And you're not at peace with yourself. And you're at odds with others. What's it matter if you look amazing and you don't live amazing? <laughs> Please put on the robes today. He made them with his own hand. They have your name on the inseam. It's your robe. It fits you. He took off your sin clothes and he robed you. I want you to go to Romans 6 and we'll close with it. Romans 6, my goodness, is imperative. Imperative for you and I to live and understand. (laughs) And please don't just quickly buy into all the Romans 7 preaching out there. If you haven't read 5, 6, and 8 and believed it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unfathomable to me how anyone can stand with confidence and preach Romans 7 and say what they say about Romans 7 and have read 5, 6, and 8. Yes. Like it's beyond my comprehension right. that it's even up for debate. It's that cut and dry and clear. He even starts Romans 7 I'm speaking to those of you who know the law, and unless you die, unless that dies, you can't give yourself to another. 
And he's actually teaching that that law died through Christ, and now we can actually give ourselves to Christ, and we're not in the state we were in. And he's talking about being delivered, and then he talks in Romans 8 about living life in the Spirit. So if in Romans 7, Paul's talking about himself, he can't possibly write 6 and 8. He's going to write 6 and 8 and say, I'm free from sin. I don't give myself to sin. I present myself to righteousness and then go to Romans 7. But hey, guys, the things I want to do, I never do. And the things I don't want to do, I always do. Hey, pray for me. (laughs) And then he goes into Romans 8 and talks about life in the spirit. Come on. Watch Romans 6. I want you to see this. Do you guys ever, do you ever, is it put somebody on the spot? Do you ever put scripture up there? Or do you just keep the man of God up there? Do you ever put, I don't know if you even have anybody on a Saturday morning, but if not, that's fine. But if it pops up there, if you could put Romans 6 up there, I'm asking a lot. In a New King James Version, because that's what I quote out of. But if not, that's fine. That's fine. We'll read it. But if you have a Bible, please go there. I want you to see it. Sometimes it's beautiful to put it on a board and just all read it together and realize this is what the Bible says. So uh, let, me, let me end up with Romans 5 here. It's, it's like verse 19, for by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. This is the end of Romans 5. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, so the law came to reveal my need for sin. Paul talks about that. So that sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, right above that he says, where sin abounded, grace abounds much more. Right? Where sin abounded, grace abounds much more. So as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness. So then Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If you have a Bible, if you have a Bible phone app, I won't believe you're texting or just checking emails. Get on your phone app, get a Bible. It's really important you see that what I'm saying is in your Bible if you have a Bible with you. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Question mark. Certainly not. Exclamation point. Watch. How shall we who died to sin? This is Paul writing. This is your word. This isn't my sermon. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? You go to church your whole life and a pastor won't even touch that scripture and tell you that we've all sinned today and thank God for his goodness. We've all sinned all week. Thank God for his goodness. They'll actually put confessions of sin on the board and that's how they'll start the service. Paul makes a comment that where sin abounded, grace is greater than sin. Not to oblige it, to overcome it, to overtake it, to crush it. Right? Right? He says, so what do we do then? If grace is abounding because of sin, should we just go on and sin so grace gets greater? So it keeps abounding? Of course not. How shall you who died to sin? Guys, we're not preaching that in altar calls. We're not preaching that in salvation calls. We're not telling people they were ruled by themselves and they need to let go of themselves because every sin a man ever committed came from self-centeredness. There ain't a sin committed that didn't come from the wellspring of self-centeredness. There's not one man that was ever angry that wasn't guilty of being self-centered. That's why he's angry to the point of sin. He's angry. He'll judge another. He'll judge another's destiny. That's why hate is murder. You see a man for what he is, not what he's created to be. So you cut off his destiny in your heart. And all you can see is what's wrong with him. And that's outside of God's love. All God saw with us is what we were created for and what our potential was and what was possible. And he didn't hold our trespasses against us. And he pleaded for us to be reconciled with him through Christ. Make sense? So how do we reckon ourselves dead to sin? How do we die to sin and, 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 and not live in it any longer? This is what Paul's saying. See, what we say is, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. We, can't, we are so 
trained and brainwashed to think it's humility to boast in our ability to fail that we can't even hear scripture anymore if we're not careful. Oh, I'm coming, thanks. No, thank you. How shall we who died to sin? We can't even preach that at large because we don't even believe that. And if somebody preaches that they're a heretic, then the Bible's a heretic. You're supposed to die to the identity of sin, to the stain of sin, to the memory of sin, to the desire and lust and compulsion of sin. You're supposed to separate yourself and come out from among them and recognize that this pool is not the Lord. It is not my calling. It is not my life. Come on. We're not addressing this when people are getting born again. We're just stopping with the forgiveness of sin. Not the living life in Christ and living life in righteousness. When Paul says, how shall we live in it any longer? Because we died to it. How shall we live in it any longer? People say, well, what are you saying? Well, we're always going to sin, brother. We're always going to... And we can't even hear the truth that's designed to make us free. So when a man preaches what I'm preaching this morning, that's what we've been brainwashed with. It's a stronghold. It's the enemy to keep the work of righteousness suppressed. So you never wear the garment that was made for you. So you go to church, serve in a ministry, and when it comes right down to it, you're still wearing fig leaves. I should come to him with confidence, with boldness. Come boldly. Not arrogantly, not presumptuously, but boldly. Why boldly? Because I see his nature. I see his love through the Christ that was crucified and raised and passed through the heavens and sits at the right hand of Almighty God. I have a high priest. He's Jesus Christ. Therefore, come boldly and receive mercy and help in a time of need. Why? Because I belong there. The door's open. He's not too busy. He loves me. He doesn't see me for where I have been. He doesn't see me for where I haven't been. He sees me for, for his, through where his son has been. Yeah. What's that do? Puts integrity in me. Builds character in me. Puts a want to in me. All of a sudden I love him and I see he's good. And it leads me to change. And then what's grace do? Empowers my faith. And starts helping me to live what I thought I never could or never even dreamed of living. And then when you say, how shall we who died to sin continue in it? Well, brother, nobody's perfect. Everybody sins. We're always sinning. What are you thinking? You don't sin. Hey, if you, have, you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth ain't even in you. When, Paul, when John quotes that in 1 John, he's not saying we have sin all the time and every day. He's talking about the blood of Jesus cleansing us, and if you say you have no sin, what he's saying is if you say you have no need for the blood, If you're saying you don't need the blood of Jesus, that you've been perfect and you don't sin, no, all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And we all need the blood of Jesus. So if you're saying you haven't sinned and don't need the blood, you're deceived and there ain't no truth in you. That's all he's saying. And then he says, but if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. In two verses, he says, you're forgiven of all sin in 1 John, and he says, you're cleansed of all unrighteousness. I don't know about you, but forgiven of all sin and cleansed of all unrighteousness sounds like it makes me clean. Sounds like if he forgave me of all unrighteousness, the only thing left could be righteousness. Wow, now I'm wearing the robe. And then he writes, if you say you have not sinned, he clarifies it. If you say you have not sinned, you deceive yourself. And the truth isn't in you. And then in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, Little children, I write these things to you that you may not sin. That's John. That's not Paul. That's John. He gets it too. And we fight these guys tooth and nail and every preacher that's trying to believe what they read. And it concerns me. I'll tell you why it concerns me. Boy, I'll get the heat for this. It's okay. Here's why it concerns me. People can only write about what they live and experience. And sin-conscious people are attacking a righteous message. And people that are conscious of their sin and all they think, and they got secrets, and they ain't living clean. I visited a church and preached just like I'm here. Pastor Matt picked me up at the airport and drove me home, and we hung out, and we came last night. Same thing at this pastor's house. And he picked me up, took me to his house. We went into service, and I let her rip. 
we got in the car and he said, hey, I, I just want to encourage you in something. You need to really be careful with something you're preaching so boldly. I said, what's that, man? What? He said, uh, just this whole thing about not having any secrets and, and being clean in your conscience. And he said, it just sounds like you're perfect and everybody has their closets. Everybody has their stuff, brother. And I said, are you for real? Everybody has their stuff? I said, you're a pastor. You're going to preach next Sunday after I leave town. You're going to preach. What's your stuff? You're only saying that because you have your stuff. Like if you didn't have your stuff, you wouldn't be saying that. So how can I help you and how can I love you? Because look me in the eyes, friend. I don't have stuff. And he broke and we got to his house and cried and sat on the corner of the bed and I ministered to him and talked to him for a long time. He had a strong hold of wrong believing. He was trained to believe that, well, we are, well nobody's perfect. We all sin. We're always going to sin. So as a man thinketh, A seed produces after its own. If the root's not good, the fruit can't be. So make a tree and the fruit will be. So guess what we were doing sitting on the corner of the bed? Making the tree good. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> it has nothing to do with willpower. It's not really discipline. It's believing like children. And just trusting the gospel. And seeing yourself different through him. Yeah. He said, you better be careful because everybody has their stuff. That told me he has his stuff. And that line is actually keeping him in that place, defending his stuff without even realizing what he's doing. And what he's saying is, because this is my reality, this is reality. That's not what I'm reading from Paul, and that's not what I'm reading from John. First John 2 says, I'll write these things to you little children that you may not sin. Watch. It doesn't say, but when you do. It says, but if you do. But if you do, just know you have an advocate, Jesus, the righteous, and his righteous plea is a perpetuation or mercy over your sins. In other words, run to him. Don't run from him. Don't put on fig leaves. Stay clothed. So I'm walking through my life. I've reckoned myself dead to sin. I'm living for Christ. I'm walking through life. And all of a sudden, I stumble into something, whether thought, a little deed, a reaction to something, an old way just kind of musters up. And it's like, whoa, where did that? See, when you're living in Christ and you're staying conscious of Christ, you're so aware of everything that's not. And it actually takes you to him. Why? Because as a man thinketh so he is, you're his son, you're going to live sonship. So if anything along the way, you go, whoa, wow, and watch what it looks like. Oh my goodness, Lord, that was so not who you are in me, and that's not who I was created to be. That is, my goodness, that's something I never want in my life. I'm not even sure where that came from, God. Thank you for the light and the truth that's working in me, exposing, revealing that stuff. Thank you today. I'm wiser and sharper and smarter because of the work of your spirit. God, continue to work in me. Thank you for your love. I appreciate your mercy and your forgiveness. Thank you. And you keep living Christ. You didn't find a way to sin and get away with it. You found a way to be free. You get it? I don't think we're teaching people this at large. I'm not saying, Pastor. Watch. How shall we who died to sin, live in it any longer. I don't think altar calls are telling people they're dying to sin. I think water baptism are just a sign that you've been washed, forgiven. Not dying to sin. That means your identity's changing. That means your purpose and motive's changing. That means there's something in you different. Are you with me? Watch. Watch, it gets better. I mean, I'm just barely starting. This is like, ah. He says, or do you not know? Well, probably a lot of us don't know. <laughs> Come on, he wouldn't ask the question. He said, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Now, he doesn't explain what that is right now, but he's going to. So we were baptized into Christ, and at being baptized into Christ, we were also baptized into his 
death. Okay? We're baptized into Christ. We have to understand that at the same time we're baptized into his death, and he'll show you what that is in a second. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. We died when he died. We live because he rose from the dead. Do you get it? So when he died, we died. Water baptism is you acting that out, contact point of faith, man, everything I've done, everything ever done against me, everywhere I've been, everywhere, everything I've ever done, it's all being called dead, I'm being washed clean, it's as if I never lived before, I'm getting born again, I'm dying to everything that was, so I can come up and live to everything that is. So down goes my past, and up comes my present and my future. Do you get it? That's so phenomenal. So watch this. So we were buried with him through baptism into death, and just as, just as, you ought to catch those phrases. There's a lot of them in your Bible. Just as Christ, making you one, making you the same as the, in this experience. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we shall walk or should walk in the newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, he keeps talking about that. He's going to explain it here in two verses, three verses or so. Watch. If we've been united together in his death, then certainly we shall walk in the likeness of his resurrection. So it's not just about dying. It's all about living. But you have to die in order to live. Isn't that something? Now watch this. Knowing this, second time you better know, knowing that our old man, you've got to know this, this is the born-again experience, guys. Knowing that the old man was crucified with him. That's why you can't look back. That's why you're not Lot's wife, you're his bride. That's why you don't look back. You never want to get stuck between where you came from and where you're supposed to be going. That's looking back. Paul said, there's one thing I do to apprehend. Not two or three. There's one thing I do to apprehend and to become and grow into everything. There's just one thing I'm doing so that I can get to where I'm going, I forget what lies behind and reach forward to what lies ahead. Just one thing. This old man was crucified with him that the body of sin would be done away with, that we should no longer, should no longer, should no longer, should no longer be slaves to sin. The use of the word slaved in this chapter is used a lot, the word slaved. It means bound and chained to do one's will. There was a time I was bound and chained to sin to do its will. This chapter tells me the chains have changed. Now I'm bound and chained to righteousness to do his will. It says I'm bound and chained to God, chained to God in the end of the chapter to do his will. He broke every chain and rechained me in a beautiful chain. He tied me to him and said, I have one verdict over you. Righteous. Clean, my son. And ain't nobody snatching me out of the palm of his hand. I'm the only one. I'm the only one that can separate me from this truth. By believing something wrong. That this body of sin, the old man was crucified, that this body of sin might be what? done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Uh-oh. See? Now, it doesn't say, for he who came to go to heaven, he who came to ask Jesus in his heart, he who asks forgiveness and wants to go to heaven, he doesn't say that. He says, he who has died. Died to what? Died to yourself. Died to you living for you. He who has died in the likeness of his death Died to sin once and for all. You'll see it. He who has died has been what? Uh-oh. What's your Bible say? No, wait. What? Freed from what? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, but brother, you're always going to sin. You sin every day. I mean, are you trying to say you're perfect and you don't sin? Come on. Everybody sins. What do you mean you're free from sin? You're never free from sin. You're going to carry sin to your grave. You're sinful all the time. Ain't that something that preachers preach that confidently from the pulpit and don't even read the Bible? He's talking about a robe, a mentality. He's talking about something Jesus paid for that's very precious and powerful if we'd stop fighting it. 
and just put it on. Yeah? He who has died has been what? Is that in your Bible or is that just in my sermon? Freed from sin. As a man thinketh, so he... If I wake up and believe I'm free from sin, am I going to fight a battle of sin or am I going to enjoy a life lived in righteousness? If I wake up and believe I'm a son, am I going to try to measure up to a son and try to qualify as a son or am I going to enjoy the blessing of sonship? Come on. What you believe is so powerful. And I'm telling you, every promise is to the believer. And the enemy's number one strategy is to taint what we believe and to rule what we believe. You better not give your believer away too quickly. And you better not sell your believer out to something cheap. Your belief is very, very, very important. Your believer is precious. You ought to guard it. With all diligence. Are you with me? Now if we died with Christ. We believe we shall also live with him. So it's not just about dying. It's about living. Knowing that. Uh oh. Third time you better know. Knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead. Dies no more. Death. No longer has dominion over him. Uh oh. Now here's the death we were buried into in baptism. Here's. If we die, we're free from sin. Here's the buried into death that he's talking about. Watch. Likewise, oh, for the death that he died, this is his death, for the death that he died. Remember, we were buried into baptism into his death. The death he died, what's this baptism? He died to what? Sin once for all. So the death he died, he died to sin Once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Now watch. Likewise, you also. Who? You. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. Oh, yeah, but brother, not me. Look, I can't. Man, that just don't sound right because we sin every day. We sin all the time. Brother, you know we sin. What are you saying? You're perfect? Come on. We're all going to take sin to our grave, man. We're going to sin every day. There ain't nothing we can do about it. It's just in us. It's in our nature. It's in our heart. Read your Bible, man. We're sinners. <laughs> that language is out there with confidence. And because people believe it, their life backs it up. And because their life backs it up, they believe it more. Now there's not even a conviction and no place to repent because we wear it as an identity. And there's not even a desire for change and the thought of change is blasphemous. Can't explain it any clearer than that. You can write whatever you write. I'll tell you what, you're going to be wrong in that day because this Bible is right. How can I reckon myself dead Indeed, to sin and alive unto God and still keep talking about my ability to commit sin and call that humility. I call it unbelief. Come on. What would happen in a man's life if he just wakes up every day? Young husband, young daddy, just wakes up every day He says, Father, I thank you. You made me for your glory. Father, I thank you. Accept me as a son. And you love me and you've washed me clean of everything I've ever done in that former life. God, thank you for empowering me. Holy Spirit, I welcome you. And just thank you for the light that you're allowing me to live in and walk in. I so appreciate your love. I would change you. I would change the way you act. I would change the way you react. That would change the way you live. I wonder if you wake up and put on Christ. I wonder if you go to bed and put on Christ so when you wake up, he's already on. I wonder if you're never naked again. <laughs> Come on. For most people, naked ain't even fun. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I'm just getting real. You can throw away all your movies and all your romantic starry eyed junk. 
People get older, they show less skin, they wear different clothes, and they don't even want to look in the mirror. Why would you ever want to be naked spiritually if it ain't fun? You're clothed. You're meant to be clothed. Stay clothed. <laughs> You're better clothed. <laughs> Sorry. Just, just relating. I don't know about you, but this is straight up clear. Is there something I'm missing? Knowing this, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more and death no longer has dominion over him for the death he died, he died to sin once for all and the life he lives, he lives. likewise you wreck in yourselves because you've been buried into that baptism, dead to sin indeed, indeed, dead indeed, dead indeed, not even just dead, dead indeed. <laughs> Come on, God's even amplifying this thing. He's the one being dramatic. You're not just dead, you're dead indeed. That's different than dead. Dead indeed is like a period, exclamation point, double period. I don't know. That's, that's dead. Dead indeed is dead. Yeah. You're dead indeed what? You're dead indeed to sin. That ain't my experience in the average Christian. In fact, when you try to preach this, you get absolute rebuttal. You get people that get mad at you and hate you for preaching scripture because it's not their experience. Because it's not their experience, it continues to be their life. And because it's their life, it's their identity. And now it can't change because they have no faith for change because this is who we are. And they're still wearing fig leaves. <laughs> That's what you ought to be right there. You ought to be just like that right there, a little child. He didn't say a child. He said a little child. You know why? Because it's not long into a child's life where they lose innocence and become aware of himself. Yep. You can see that time in their life where they have no self-consciousness. It's the most beautiful thing. I could be down here preaching on the floor and a little baby wander from its mom and the mom is doing something and not paying attention. All of a sudden, she's horrified. And she's like, oh. she's like, he's up at the preacher. And she's like, oh, my gosh. And the baby don't even know what he's doing. He did. <laughs> he's walking around, looking at stuff, touching things. Has no clue the whole church is looking at him. Go over and look at the pastor. Not aware of himself. Unless you become like a little child, you'll never by any means see the kingdom of God. I'm about done here. Likewise, you also reckon yourself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God in Christ our Lord. Therefore, therefore, because you reckon yourself dead to sin, don't let it reign in your mortal body. That's where you have to take a stand. That's where you have to stay in fellowship with God. Watch. You not wanting to sin won't change sin. You staying in fellowship with God will seal your identity and fellowship and relationship and his grace will begin to empower you and you'll see it for what it really is. It'll open your understanding. You have to do this thing with the spirit, by the spirit. He who lives in the spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It doesn't say he who doesn't want to fulfill the lust of the flesh won't. And if it's in his heart not to, he won't. See, that's the stuff the devil says, and then he condemns you when you do, but you're doing it in your own strength, not his. Are you with me? Yes. Don't pre or present or let sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you should obey it in its lust. So sin comes in lustful form. You denied yourself. You're in relationship with God. You've just reckoned yourself dead indeed to sin and alive unto God. Come on. You just believe in he loves you. You believe in you're clean because of the word he's spoken. You believe in you're a son. When you're living that way, there's a grace empowering you. When lusts and things come, it gets blown away by the truth you're standing in, by the thing you're believing. Does that make sense to you? You have to see yourself in Christ to live that way. It's not willpower. It's not discipline. It's saved by grace through faith. That's why Paul said, I am what I am by the 
grace of God. That's why he said there's no boasting in men. If a man has something, he's only received it. God's given it. That's why there's no boasting in men. So if there's no boasting in men, there's boasting in the Lord. If you are what you are by the grace of God, who gets all the glory? And now you're living something you know you could never live apart from him. And now you love him more. And now you trust him more. And now you want him more. Now you're closer than ever before. And now you're living it even more. You get it? Therefore, we're not letting this reign in our body, this thing called sin. We're not going to obey it in its lust. And we're not going to present our members as instruments of unrighteousness. That could just be in your identity. You could be presenting yourself just by wrong believing. That just doesn't mean actions, wrong believing, seeing yourself that way. We're not going to. We're not going to present. No way. We're not going to present ourselves as members of instruments to, of unrighteousness to sin, but present ourselves to God as being alive from the dead. Ain't that amazing? And our members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Uh Uh-oh, he knows what people think. What then? Shall we just go ahead and sin because we're not under the law? No, we already covered that. And do you not know, fourth time, you better know, that to whom, here's here's where identity comes in. Watch this. This is powerful. Do you not know the tomb you present yourself a slave to obey? Whatever you're believing about this is what you're going to serve. That's what he's saying. So whatever you obey, you're going to be that one slave whom you obey. Whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. He's making it so simple. He's saying, guys, it's the eye. It's the lamp of the body. Whatever you present yourself to be is the fruit you're going to bear. And you're going to be that one slave. You're going to produce what you believe. But God be thanked. Now, Paul's being really positive and amazing here in a loving father. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin. Yep, there was a time in your life it owned you and you were at the mercy of sin and there's no mercy. Yet you obeyed from the heart. That's that point of transition and change. That form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Do you know you can go to church your whole life and never be delivered this doctrine? Your whole life and never be delivered this doctrine. That's a scary thought. And having the, uh uh-oh, verse 18, are you kidding me? And having been, having been, now that we established this, having been set free from what? Uh Uh-oh. See how the chains chained? Changed? The chains chained. Changed. That's a tongue twister. The chains changed. Watch. You were tied and chained and bound to sin to do its will, but now you've been set free from that. Now you've become bound and chained to do the will of righteousness. Ain't that amazing? So you were a slave to sin. You were set free, though. And now you became a slave of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness, for lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. Why? Because as a man thinketh, so he is. So now, same thing, just reverse it, flip the coin, present yourself as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So what's the fruit of believing righteousness? A holy life without you biting your lip trying to be holy. Why? Because the eye is the lamp of the body. And if you see it, you become it. Isn't that amazing? It's all right here. So now, so now, Present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were a slave of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Okay, so he flips it. So now if I'm a slave to righteousness, I'm free in regard to sin. So when I was stuck in sin, I was free in regard for righteousness. What do a lot of preachers do and people that attack the message of righteousness? They're actually fighting to stay in the first thing. A slave to sin and they're fighting righteousness. Well, yeah, he's just saying we're forgiven. No, he's saying I'm righteous. I have right standing with God. No sense of guilt, condemnation, or shame. Colossians 1, holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. It's different than just forgiveness. It's clean, and it's free. What fruit did you have then in the things which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, oh, he sticks it in there a third time. I love you, Lord. But now having been set free, I've been in churches and services, I didn't do it to y'all, 
But I get them to say it like 20 times. I can say, what's it say? Read it out loud. And people almost read it tentatively. When they say we're free from sin, it's almost like they've been almost trained to, that they're not supposed to believe that. And they'll say it like mealy mouth, and they'll say it kind of quiet. I say, come on, do you guys even believe what you're reading? Say that again, what's it say? And I'll, get, I'll just be a little redundant and get them to say it over and over and over. See, I spared you. I didn't do that to you. I just believe you believe this. But now, but now, see, we're talking about now. We're not talking about then, but now, having been set free from Shoo, you ought to see that's in your Bible. Yeah? And having been come a slave of God, you have your fruit to holiness. Whew, well, nobody can live holy, brother. No, but you can believe righteousness. You can believe righteousness, and righteousness can produce holiness, and all the glory goes to God. Is it possible to live holy? It says so. Is it possible to live pure? He says the pure in heart shall see God. It must be a person out there that can become that. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. It must be possible to live pure. He says, be holy for I am holy. It must be possible to walk in this thing. Ain't that something? See, I got enough scripture to convince me. Having been set free from sin and having become a slave to God, you have your fruit to holiness. In the end of that, it's everlasting life. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. How clear is that, guys? Does that make sense to your heart? Do you know that that revelation right there is what gives me confidence and faith to pray for the sick? I actually don't pray for the sick and have the confidence to pray for the sick just because the scripture's on healing. I mean, that's faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. But I'm being honest with you and personal with you. The number one faith factor in my life for praying for the sick is the forgiveness of sins. The fact that God forgives sins he heals all disease. It's part of his benefit. And you bless him, O oh, your soul. And all that is within you, bless his holy name. And forget not his benefits. Who forgives all your sin and heals all your... Jesus looks at the paralytic. They lower him through the roof. He says, take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Okay, that's great. I'm sure they didn't tear off the roof to hear that. Be real with me. They didn't rip a man's roof off to hear his sins were forgiven. They ripped the roof off hoping he could walk. And what's Jesus do being an amazing teacher? He says, hey, son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. What do they do as soon as he says it? Wah, 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 wah. He says, why do you guys always think evil and, and just have stuff going on in your hearts? Why? It's like everything Jesus said. Because they're, they're not listening to hear what he's saying. They're listening to hear what they don't agree with. And that's a big difference. And that's where critical spirit loves to live and abide. So Jesus says, take hearts on your sins are forgiven. And then, rah, 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 rah. And he says, why are you always thinking evil in your hearts? What's easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise and walk? But to show you the son of God or the son of man. I'm not sure. I think he says the son of God. But to show you the son of God has the power to forgive sin. I'd have to look. He might say the son of man there. To show you the Son of God has the power to forgive sin. Go ahead, rise and walk. What's he saying? I'm healing you because of the mercy of God that forgives sin and sees you clean. What's James say? James 5, is any among you sick? Let them ask for the elders of the church to come and pray over them, anointing them with oil, praying the prayer of faith. Watch, not the anointing of oil. That's a contact point of faith that Holy Spirit's here, but watch this. And the prayer of faith will... Save the sick, heal the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Watch. And if he's committed any sins, it'll be forgiven. What's he saying? To be healed is to be forgiven. To be forgiven is to be healed. Watch. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that ye might be... Wow. Can you tell I read this book? <laughs> it's all there. It's all connected. To be healed is to be forgiven. To be forgiven is to be healed. The faith in our hearts to pray for the sick shouldn't be just because we hope they feel better and they're healed. It should be that God forgives men of their sin and he's not imputing their trespasses through the blood of Jesus that speaks better things. That's why we can go into all the world and preach the gospel and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast, raise the dead and cast out devils. They might not even be born again. How can they 
get healed if they're not born again? How can they get healed if they haven't asked for the forgiveness of sins? I write these things to you, little children, so you may not sin. But if you do sin, you have Jesus Christ the righteous, and his righteous plea will be a propitiation, a mercy seat for your sins, and not only your sins, but also the sins of the whole world. It's First John chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 5 says, now we're ambassadors. We're going out into the world. We're pleading with men, be reconciled to God, not imputing their trespasses just like Jesus did. Ain't that something? 